Okay, so man, this uh, presentation I'm going to talk about some structure <coughs> system modeling and control techniques. We already heard, uh, I guess, quite a lot about the, you know, how you know, control is becoming a bottleneck of a real-time hyper simulation. <coughs> so high accuracy, high, uh, high precision motion control really makes the difference of the world. So. But before that, I'm going to talk about a little bit about why do system models. And, uh, you know, normally system modeling is a pre-step before you can come up with a good control, right? You need to know your system dynamics, and then you can try to design a good controller to, you know, manipulate and control that dynamics. And uh, in MPS, we have a couple ways to do uh, system modeling. I'm going to go into detail using different uh, software packages, and we can do a course co-simulation among different uh, software packages as well. And uh, the third uh, main subtopic, I will introduce uh, several of the control algorithms, control strategies we have uh, uh, developed or being used. Uh, very, uh, we, we tested them to be very effective. A uh, couple of them, I will go in give you a concept about how this algorithm works. Of course, it's not going to be going every single detail. And finally, I'm going to do a quick summary. So why are the models necessary? So as we see in the past two days, when especially when you go to real-time hybrid simulation, or you're doing advanced stick table testing, so it's actually a very, very much like a multidisciplinary uh, you know, type of uh, study. Uh, I think Andreas also mentioned that a little bit uh, yesterday. It's a collaborative effort of uh, you know structure engineering because a lot of us we are structure applications. You need to know about structure engineering. You need to know about the computational mechanics, how to do you know FEA modeling, what type of integration solver you need to choose to make sure that actually works, and uh, then control theory. You need to have a very high high-performance high control algorithm to make all these uh, systems work together with high fidelity. And uh, in addition to, to that, you might, need, you might have a lot of other like physics <coughs> or data-based model you need to use like uh, more and more uh, you know, damping devices, vibration suppression devices are being brought into the uh, world, uh, structure engineering world, which you might not even have a good analytical model. You need to do some database modeling. And uh, like I was talking to one of the professors here from uh, Carleton University, uh, he mentioned that he has a lot of uh, database model, uh, you know, from real uh, from real world data measurement, and you can convert those models into uh, you know doing some model updating, convert that into some sort of uh, analytical model to use it in your hybrid simulation. You see. Of course, doing real-time computing, everything has to happen in real-time. At least that's what we try to do, push this uh, technology ahead. And uh, the loads involves a lot of embedded systems. And uh, the sensor, actuator, they all have their own dynamics. Uh, Andreas also mentioned, you know, the feedback measurement, those noise, sometimes could get, into, get you into trouble. Like, for example, also Montreal, uh, folk also mentioned about those friction, you know, all those things, you need to take care of them. So boil down everything, I would like to wheel everything into a system. You know, all those things could be put into a block, you know, what's my input, what's my output, they are interconnected with other subsystems, eventually if I can come up with a good system, uh, it's a lot of them are feedback, you know, closed loop control system, eventually then, I, I get a good understanding about my overall dynamics. So, in terms of into a little bit more detail, for example, what are, are the realistic things we need to deal with, at least in the first step? Actuator all are driven by several, uh, several valves, at least our solution, our several hydraulic solution. The servo valve itself has a large nonlinearity. Only to modeling that part is already challenging enough. And the test specimen, a lot of them, they are very heavy and they are under damp. <coughs> and they actually started to interact with your actuator. And that's the dynamical coupling over there. 
and uh, the hydraulic system has its own dynamics and then when you have multiple actuators and they are connected to some, through some specimen and if that specimen is a flexible specimen has its own dynamics then all these dynamic interactions start to really make the things very difficult and uh, in terms of a real-time hybrid system that's our theme for today at least uh, you know. so as I presented in my previous uh, uh, session it sometimes poses very stringent criteria on the level of control accuracy we're talking about you know millisecond single digit one millisecond or even we want to enforce eliminate if possible which a lot of times you will need a good system model to come up with a good control design and another specific challenge for real-time hybrid simulation is that we cannot afford iterative control you know it's all the signals are calculated in real time online it's not predefined so you cannot really do an iterative control so everything has to be happen in one shot so the models can help us to answer two important questions first what's the capacity can we do this test at all or it's going to go unstable even you know we can predict it before we do the test and then if we can do it then what's the performance what's the kind of accuracy we can achieve so eventually if we, we want to you know come up with a better overall system model to answer those two questions so what effects can we model in MTS we have good knowledge and uh, expertise we know the servo valve dynamics there are a lot of factors which actually you know, design parameter factors to uh, affect the servo valve dynamics and the actuator of course itself it's a mechanical device it also has a lot of uh, uh, design parameters you need to be aware of come up with a good model the hydraulic system has its own model specimen you know it has its own dynamics it will interact with your control systems and when you go to the high, you know, shake table that becomes more complicated so those are some of the things we can model and uh, for example this is a simulating environment I think a lot of us we have heard multiple times of it the strength of simulating modeling environment is that it, it has a lot of uh, functionalities to model a dynamical system and a control system so that this is the typical closed loop control system we have our controller and then we will have a you know I call it it's a plant which is the, the you know the, 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 the actuator plus you know the specimen and everything is being controlled here compared you know the plant is just terminology for the control uh, control guys so this is a feedback control system and the MPS of course we have our uh, you know we know everything that is inside our flex test controller so this is just showing you a schematic of the S function we built you know like uh, also uh, Salim just mentioned he actually break into those blocks and showed some of the details in there but eventually there are a bunch of parameters a lot of uh, you know tuning uh, things going inside there and the actuator itself also we you know we have a very good model about those and uh, you know normally we give it in the S function format for you if you need to do some uh, simu uh, simulation offline virtual testing stuff like that and once we go beyond that if it's only the controller and the, the, the actuator so it's, it's still easier the difficult thing is that if you're only running a, just a single actuator without any specimen it's, it's, it's easy right but when you started to have some specimen coupled with this uh, uh, you know actuator control system then the specimen dynamics started to play a very significant role here it started to interact with your you know servo control, uh, servo control system and depends on what type of specimen you have this interaction could be at lower frequency could be at mid frequency in the more challenged cases if you go to higher frequency if there are those interactions then those are hard to deal with 
So now there's a, a software platform we use very often in uh, MTS is Adams. It's a multi-body dynamic software. So it's the strength of this is to modeling a mechanical system. All the moving parts, the motion, the force, different joints, those joints could be highly nonlinear, you know, the rubber, you know, those uh, highly uh, inelastic material. We can insert in there and the, the whole system motion uh, could be modeled in atoms fairly uh, you know, nicely. For example, this atom is one of the most widely uh, CAE software in the vehicle dynamics industry. Pretty much uh, a lot of the, most of the vehicle development, they will need to do some uh, atoms modeling first, then do some testing, combining loads, then stuff like that. I think Shang Yu is going to talk more about this later in his afternoon session. And then, for a civil engineering application, a lot of times we will have some flexible parts. Not only rigid parts, then Adams also allows you to import a flexible model into it so that you can actually capture the, the flexible body there as well, the stress and string, stuff like that. And uh, we can also do Adams and simulating co-simulation, which, you know, as I said, Adams is uh, very good at mechanical system modeling for those uh, you know, parts, the joints, bushing, the dampers. And Simulink is strong in modeling the you know, uh, control system. So then we can actually export the Adams model and import it into Simulink model. So now you have a better integrated system. And uh, to show you a, a, a quick uh, idea, I think some of you also showed this slide yesterday a little bit. So for example, that's the controller, that's the actuator model, this is the Adams model we could import into Simulink. And now, you have a more realistic system model to play with, to understand all the dynamics. So, just a brief introduction about different modeling technique. And another thing I just want to quickly mention is uh, even though we have a lot of modeling uh, technique, we have a lot of calibrated uh, parameters, but we know that from a modeler perspective, there's never, never enough, right? So, a lot of times you still have a lot of uncertainties, either the parametric uncertainty or non-parametric uncertainty. So another type of uh, technique is that we can do some robust modeling as well, which actually, uh, you know, inside my lab and single link, you can do that. So, for example, what I'm showing here is uh, like an uh, uh, actuator response. It's a closed loop inner uh, PID uh, com coupled with the actuator. So this is the frequency response function in the frequency domain. This is the step response in the time domain. So the blue line here showing it's a nominal system performance. Meaning that, okay, that's probably my best guess of my system dynamics. But we know that those red curves are that, okay, so you might have some uncertainties in there. It could be somewhere here, here, you know, it could be all over the places, depending on what's your uncertainty bound. If you have large uncertainty or smaller uncertainty. So this black curve I'm showing here is called the worst case realization, meaning that given an uncertainty bound, a lot of times, if, let's say we we know there's per, there might be some uncertainty for a specific parameter. I may need I may know the bound of it. I probably don't know the exact accurate value, but I may know that okay, it's not going to be more than fifty percent, more than what I uh, I assume. So once you give a bound, then this system will tell you okay, what's my worst case uh, realization? Meaning that this system is just going to give you the highest uh, gain. And this gain, as we know that in the frequency domain, if this gain goes upper and upper, that brings down your stability margin. It's like the, you know, we saw those structure damping frequency response function. When that, that guy goes very high, it's very easy to go unstable. Similar in the time domain, it also can allow you to do that. And uh, one more step further from here, you can construct some kind of a sensitivity curve uh, here it calls the performance degradation curve. For example, this is for one of the parameters. If I bring this worst case gain 
plotted tensile shear as a function of the uncertainty level. For example, at 50% uncertainty, looks like it's not so much higher than my nominal system. But as the uncertainty goes higher and higher, you can see this curve start to go up very quickly. So that it is very sensitive to your, this parameter, uncertainty. But given another parameter, even though I give a lot of uncertainty in there, pretty much it's not going to change my system dynamics that much. It's still pretty much flat, comparable to my nominal assumption. So it's just another tool that you can play with when you have such a complicated system. You know some of the key parameter. You might know the bound, but you don't know the exact accurate uh, nigga, accurate uh, value. You can do uh, some sensitivity study. Very neat too. So much about modeling. Then next one, I will go and talk about a couple of uh, control. Uh, Techniques. So the first uh, control technique, uh, actually, Andreas and Shang Yu both already talked about it. Andreas, in the original formulation, is called ATS, Adaptive Time Series uh, uh, Control. Uh, time, uh, then, this is a control algorithm, which, as Andreas mentioned, both him and MPS, we have very good. Uh, 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 experience with it, it actually, it's, it's, it works very well on a lot of the applications. I will draw a little bit into the theory of this, and of course this was developed originally by, doc, by Dr. Che, Professor Che, when he was at Lehigh, right now he's a professor uh, at uh, Old Dominion uh, University. So the idea of this algorithm to do control is that, okay, I know my dynamics, I know my plan, right? So if it can be, it actually assumes it's a second order dynamics. That's my plan. Then the idea is that I can come out with a feed forward controller. So this is the inverse of that uh, plan. For example, that's the inverse. And if we plug them in series, it's a feed forward controller. It will cancel all, all the dynamics. So eventually, my feedback measurement will be the same as my command. That's our control goal. It's a motion control is a tracking control, right? That's our goal. But this direct inverse is not possible because it's a non-proper system, meaning that when the frequency, this is the last uh, operator, right? When this goes to higher frequency, it goes grow unbounded. So you cannot directly implement a system like this. But instead, you can do a time domain implementation because the second order is just the, the acceleration term. The first order is the velocity term, and this constant is just the displacement term. So essentially, you bring in those three uh, signals, you do, you get this, and it's kind of like a pseudo inverse of your plant dynamics then you achieve a good control. How can we get those three parameters? We know those three parameters, they are not constant for most of the systems, because, yeah, realistically talking, all physical systems, they are nonlinear. So these are not uh, going to be constant, and you don't know it ahead of time. So then you can do some uh, online optimization, for example, using this quadratic form, so this Q is just the number of steps, samples, you want to take. For example, that's the displacement, velocity, acceleration term. But you can take a window, let's say, a thousand data points before the current time step, right? Then you really have a three by one thousand matrix. Then you do this optimization, and it solves it and it gives you the vector of those three values. And it's adaptive uh, algorithm in the sense this whole thing is being solved every time step. Let's see, it's uh, 1024 hertz. Every min one millisecond, you solve this al algorithm, it gives you a new set of A values. The next time step, it becomes a different value. It's adaptive, meaning that your system dynamics changes, and then your controller actually changes according to your system dynamics. 
So here is the paper, they propose this algorithm. So the only one shortcoming about the way doing this way is that the computational load is actually quite high. As I, as I told you, this guy is actually a pretty big matrix. And you are doing a matrix multiply another big matrix. Every single one milliseconds you need to do that, and you shift to next step, you do that again. So there is a way to reduce that computational effort. That's what uh, MKS did. Brad Song is our control system, uh, system expert, expert. His name was mentioned a couple of times. He did some improvement to make a recursive this square optimization solver. Basically, what it does is that for that window, when we shift it, the majority, the 99, 999 uh, samples, they are still the same. You are just shifting one step, right? You are getting one new vector, one new column of, uh, of data, and then applying some kind of uh, forgetting factor technique. You don't have to redo this big matrix uh, calculation in every time step. You can actually improve that solver very, uh, very, uh, very efficiently. So after that improvement, we can plug in a lot of those blocks into your simulink real time, then it works very well. And this one already presented by Sean Yu and Andreas. Uh, it's a co collaboration effort between MTS, Berkeley, and Tongji on this uh, shake table commissioning uh, project. I actually, I, I wasn't involved in this, this project. I just borrowed the slides. Two of them actually did uh, all the work to make it happen. So, Andreas already mentioned it, I don't think I want to repeat it any, uh, too much. So essentially, the point is that this project, actually, the algorithm, the control algorithm uh, we just mentioned, was the key enabler to make this project a success. After that, both Andreas and MTS uh, Berkeley all use this algorithm uh, 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 many, on many applications. It uh, worked uh, very well so far. So another control algorithm I'm going to touch base a little bit about is uh, the H infinity loop shaking control strategy. So this is uh, very different. It's not uh, based on any. Uh, it's not based on inverse dynamics anymore. Instead, what happened is that okay, see we have a plant. This is the plant need to be controlled. This is our controller. We have input and output disturbances. We have a measurement, sig uh, measurement noise, you know, a lot of uh, signals go in there. And our goal, of course, we have a desired signal, we have the measured signal, we want to make them as close as possible to reduce the control error. So the dynamic equation out of this feedback uh, uh, closed loop system is, uh, is like that. So. As I said, our goal is to make xm follow as close as possible to xd. To make that happen, we need to make this t0 goes to unity. And another thing, we want to minimize this disturbance impact. Right? Those could be, let's say, friction, you know, all sorts of things, signals coming into your system that you don't want. I want to reduce those effects. So I need to make this S0 goes to zero, go to very small value. So T0 goes to unity, S0 to go to zero. How do we make that happen? If you look at the expression of this S0 and T0, a way to make it happen is to make this GH to be a very high value. So when this goes to very high value, this guy goes to nearly zero, and this guy goes to nearly unity. And uh, what is the GH? GH is actually the open loop gain. If you cut this closed loop pass, just look at this open loop. It's a GH is your open loop gain. So now we transform a closed loop tracking problem into an open loop gain shaping problem. So this is showing, for example, in the lower frequency range, we want a high performance tracking. We can shape the loop gain to be high so you can get accurate control. But at higher frequency, of course, the trade-off is higher frequency is always difficult to model. There are a lot of uh, uncertainties, a lot of disturbances, measurement noises. I need to reduce my loop gain sharply so that my system is robustly stable. 
it's not going to be, you know, otherwise if you shape the gain to be very aggressive at higher frequency, this controller itself will become unstable suddenly due to the small uncertainty or anything you didn't consider in your system model. So that's just another strategy to do a actuator motion control. And this is like the, the design steps. I'm not going to do go into any detail, but eventually that primary H infinity controller can be nicely formulated into a state space formulation. So those are algorithms already invented by control theory uh, guys. We are just application, we use that. So, the, another nice thing about this uh, H-infinity controller is that actually the formulation of the algorithm itself is applicable to multiple input and multiple output system, right? Most of the other controllers we look at is like a single input, single output. It doesn't consider the cross-coupling, at least not explicitly. But when you have a strong cross-coupling between different actuators, per se, so this H infinity controller actually can shape your loop gain. Now, what's the gain to shape? It's actually the singular value, maximum singular value. If you do singular value decomposition, and then for MIMO system, it works on your singular value to shape your loop gain. So example here, we have uh, two actuators, each collected to one floor, and that's a portal frame structure. This guy is actually pretty steep compared to the actuator size. So before we insert this uh, H infinity outer loop, so that's what happened. This is the, the frequency response function. Of course, now it becomes a matrix format, right? And then this is the amplitude of the M uh, FRF. So you can say that for the first actuator, if I want to move at a magnitude of 1, it only reaches about 0 0.6 or less than 0 0.7. Vice versa, the second actuator, it didn't go up to 1 as well because the other guy is fighting it. On the other hand, on the off diagonal term, those are the cross coupling. They have about 20-30% uh, of cross coupling over there. Those are not good. So after we apply that H infinity controller, what we can do is we can, okay, first we can push these diagonal terms back to be closer to one, at least up to 15, uh, 15 hertz. Looks pretty good. More importantly, those off diagonal cross coupling terms can be reduced to minimum. So now if I want to control my actuator, even two of them are appearing at the same time, I can nearly control them each individually, get rid of the cross coupling. Mm -hmm. And in terms of phase, we talked a lot about the phase error, which causes negative damping, which causes the real-time system to go unstable. Good thing is that this controller can also push your system delay to nearly zero until 15 hertz. So that's you know pretty good controller as well, which can make your hybrid system a real-time hybrid simulation, a reality. So we did that, and then that's the test we did. You know, on the first floor, on the second floor, you look at the response from the reference system, which is, again, without considering any hybrid configuration, pure analysis, and then we do the real-time hybrid simulation, compare on top of it, it's very good results. A good, another thing is we can, again, do a Frequency response analysis in the frequency domain, right? That's that one has the our numerical substructure, experimental substructure, the H infinity uh, uh, outer loop compensator, pretty much all those subsystems integrated in there, and we can look at the uh, system response. You see the first uh, second mode. It's very much. It's very close to the reference system response, but there is the artificial mode being introduced here due to the outer loop H infinity controller. At the higher frequency, a lot of the control design actually has that issue. You are able to deal with the frequency bandwidth you could, but upper to the higher frequency range, you might introduce some unwanted dynamics. But the thing is that it's high, this high mode 
has a relatively less, much less magnitude than those two real modes, and it's at higher frequency. So in the time domain, you don't really see that much. But that's something you need to be aware of because it depends on how you design your outer loop and controller. If it's too aggressive, per se, if you, you try to bring the tracking performance at this frequency, design your controller to be too aggressive, this mode could easily make your hybrid system go unstable. So uh, then we also did some validation when we have some MR damper devices embedded into this portal frame. And of course, we did pure analysis. We have a good model of this MR damper. And as you can see here, it's a very highly nonlinear system and it's rate dependent. That's the purpose we do hybrid, real time hybrid simulation. Then we, do, we did a one case with this being analytical uh, model and damper being tested physically. And the next one will be actually damper also integrated into the physical setup to do a real time hybrid simulation. So those are some results. Uh, it's probably a little bit difficult to say. And uh, eventually the, the, the idea is that all those uh, uh, three phases, the response, they match with each other fairly well. And this light blue color actually shows you the uncontrolled response, meaning that we have also another case without MR damper. We don't consider the damper inside. It's only the natural structure response. And the idea is that, you know, by putting into MR damper in there, it can reduce the vibration quite significantly. And you can see those are two different tests. The, 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 the second test, we actually increase the, the, the mode to be, this personal mode is about 3 hertz and second is about 16 hertz. It's pretty high frequency already. We could still get a pretty good results. So the next one is the specimen dynamic compensation. It's another control algorithm. This is Brad Song, our uh, control system expert. He actually invented this algorithm. I'm going to go very briefly about it, since I don't know all the details. <laughs> so the idea is that when you have a shake table you need to control, if it's a bare table, empty table, it's relatively easy. Well, relatively. <coughs> compared when you set up a big specimen on top of it. Because when you start to shake it, the specimen has its own dynamics. It will interact with the table. Table want to go in one direction, the shape, the, the specimen actually is actually moving in another direction. Cause great interaction. It's all dynamic interaction again. So SDC is the algorithm trying to basically reduce or you know reduce that uh, interaction so that we try to basically measure the, the table force and then in the algorithm we can treat that force as the external signal so we can subtract that and then as if we are actually only controlling the, the bare table, the empty table. If you, the, go, the goal is here, you can see that's the shake table and the specimen interaction. Big uh, peak, it's a pole here, it's a zero here. That's the thing you can really, it's really difficult to control. But the, the SDC will try to augment that actuator control force by this measured force from your table surface, which is the base shear from your specimen. And then your table driving force now becomes the correct amount of force to just like you are. For SDC, think about that, okay, I'm actually going to treat that as if the specimen doesn't exist because the specimen force are already measured. Yeah, in the SDC algorithm, I will just simply get rid of that, that term. Of course, it's not simple as that. It's a dynamical phenomenon, but that's the concept. So we can do two ways. We can either measure from a low cell, we can also do through a, a, some mathematical observer, like uh, Andreas mentioned. You can come up with some mathematical observer to estimate that force if you don't have a sensor, physical sensor there. This algorithm actually, uh, we already, uh, Abrad Song already did some preliminary validation on that. So for example, this one test rig in the uh, University of Nevada, Reno. A bunch of uh, uh, people are actually from University of Nevada. Uh, I think we 
uh, I heard that uh, MTS is trying to go back and do some more thorough validation. So for example, this test has a large mass, and this, uh, this is the column connected to that mass. So this like a single degree freedom specimen on top of the shake table. So, and the frequency of that uh, specimen is about <coughs> four hertz, the natural frequency. So the thing is that when you do, you know, that's the interaction again. At that natural frequency, the specimen and the table start to interact, cause a hole, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a peak, it's a, it's a peak, and there is a, it's a hole. It's like the poles and zeros inside your system. So after you apply the SDC algorithm, you can see it can flatten it out very well. So then it's much easier to control this system than this system. And then it's the biaxial testing. So now it's actually two direction. Again, uh, a big uh, single degree freedom dynamic specimen on top of it. In the x direction, it's about five thirds. So you see this uh, interaction. At the y direction, it's about uh, 7.6 thirds. That's again the interaction there. Uh, the applying the SDC, it can reduce that dynamic interaction uh, significantly. Finally, uh, to summarize it, so we see system modeling is important for advanced dynamic testing. Our goal is to gain a system understanding about uh, you know, what's my performance limit and what's my accuracy we, I can achieve. In order to do that, there are a lot of things you need to consider. There are a lot of modeling tools. You might need to integrate them together. Each of them has a different strengths to model different uh, subsystems. And then the next one is about the advanced motion control strategy. A lot of terms a lot of times for uh, 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 highly complicated testing, those are the enablers for your testing. We have to have a very good control strategy in order to go make your testing successful. And we do have uh, some solutions to do that. So thank you so much. I think uh, it's about right on time. Thank you.